door swings wide see glory yes i run inside the throne before you i bow the veil is torn the door swings wide i see glory yes i run inside the throne before you I bow, I bow. The veil is torn, the door swings wide. I see glory as I run inside the throne room before.
Jesus. Uh, well, good morning, Carrick Gillen Church. It's good to be with you. Forgive me for being in my civvies today, but we've just had a hectic week. And uh, Mark and I, um, for recording purposes, just, he said to me, if you can call in tonight. Um, so bear with me. Um, tonight, I'm, I'm continuing to look at Jonah. I want to look at, at Jonah um, in the third chapter. And we want to pull out some things in there. Um, and I've been thinking about God, the, the, the God who is benevolent, who is... Um, kindly towards you and I, the God who, who, who loves us, the God who continues to show goodwill and good favour and mercy and grace towards us. And I want to think about that a little bit today. And forgive me, I, I know we're all familiar with this story of Jonah, but I pray last week and this week that you will get a little something, that God will do something with this um, few thoughts and bless you and challenge you. And maybe you'll want to pass it on to someone else if you're blessed. That's a good thing to do. Before we do that, let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you that we can be sitting here together. We thank you that is uh, the Bible says that we're um, clothed and seen and in our right minds. Lord, we're sitting here and we're able to know you. We're able to know who you are. We're able to know what it means to be in your family. We're able to know what it is to know grace and mercy in our lives. We're able to walk as your children. And we don't take that for granted. We are so grateful, Lord, every day your mercies are new and we are so thankful for those. And today, Lord, I pray that you would continue to help us in this summer season that we would know you're enabling and you're strengthening. Lord, I pray for those at home today. I just pray, Lord, um, that for whatever reason that we're, we're at home and not in the building here at church, God, I pray that we would have that encounter of your Holy Spirit's presence. Um, and Lord, I don't even know how that works, but I just ask that you would be there present, strengthening, enabling, equipping, meeting us at the point of our greatest need, and Lord, that you would be blessing. So Lord, we, we look to you tonight. We pray that you would bless us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So let's jump straight into the text, Jonah chapter 3. And for you at home, get your Bible, because we're going to primarily work through the, this third chapter. The Bible says, we're going to look at the first six verses. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now, last week we looked at the first time that God spoke to Jonah. And he said, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to them. I've seen their wickedness and, and, and proclaim to them the judgment that is coming. And he says, go to the great city of Nineveh again and proclaim the message I have given you. So Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, the Nineveh was a large city. It took three days to go through it. And Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. As sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes and covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. I'm going to stop there for the moment, then we'll come back to the text a little bit later. The story of Jonah is amazing. And part of the wrestle that we have is getting past our Sunday school thinking about this. That Jonah was this little man who could swallow by a big fish and that's the most amazing part of the story. Actually, that's not the most amazing part of the story. It's a significant part and it's something that gives us note but it's not the most amazing part of the story. For me, the story of Jonah, the most amazing part of Jonah's story is this, that God has one singular conversation with Jonah, but not just once. He has the same conversation twice. Uh, we read this, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. The same message was there, no alterations, no refinement, no softening of the message to make it a little bit tolerant, uh, tolerable. But this same message, proclaim uh, to, the, to the Ninevites the message I gave you. And the text tells us what that message was. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Nineveh will be overthrown. God rarely changes his message. Why? Because his message is always correct. He 
rarely will say to us, go left. No, I, I got that wrong, go right. He will rarely say to us, be silent. No, I got that wrong, speak. He will rarely say to us, be generous. No, I got that wrong, withdraw. God's ways are perfect. Um, the Bible tells us that he is perfect in all his ways and he is just, Deuteronomy tells us that. And therefore, when we come to God and he's given us a message, I need to tell you, he will not change that message. But there might be a process in our hearts and in our lives before we get on board with the message. Jonah chapter 1, God said, go. I've seen their wickedness, tell them. 40 days, their city will be overthrown. Jonah 3, same message. I wonder this morning, has God given you a message? A message for a loved one, a message for a friend, a message for a neighbor, a message for your wife or your husband. I wonder has God given you a message for yourself? And you may be thinking, I'm not on board with that. It doesn't sit well with me. It could be too costly, or I don't like the potential outcome. So I'm just gonna wait and see if there's another message. I'm not sure that you will get another message. In fact, I'm fairly sure you won't, because God's ways are perfect. He, he, he knows the end from the beginning, and therefore he knows what he is asking us to do. Well, you're saying, well, that's an Old Testament story about Jonah. You know, in the New Covenant, the New Testament, um, God through his Holy Spirit is very different. Well, he's not. Because Paul reminds the church in Rome um, of the same unchangeable nature of God's sovereign plan. And what is God's sov sovereign plan? It's a plan to rescue humanity. And actually in Jonah, we see that his plan was to rescue humanity, a particularly bad bunch of humanity. But I don't know if they were any worse than the Romans. Paul says this, Romans 10, 1 to 4, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. He said, my desire and my prayer is that Israel is saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's ways of making people right with himself. In fact, they're refusing to accept God's way. They cling to their own way, forgetting for, for getting right with, with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. Paul writing to the church in Rome, he says, I desire that these zealous Jewish Israeli people who really want to please God and encounter his goodness, I'm really praying that they do. But the problem is they're refusing to accept or to obey God's way of coming to peace with him. And actually, it is, hasn't changed. The world in which we live in, and actually the world in which I live in, my life, often has this problem with this one little word, obedience. Obeying God. Often I find that I want it differently, or, I, or, or, or it seems too simple, or it seems too difficult. And I go, that, that doesn't fit well. I think there's a better way. Paul writing to the Romans, he says this, this whole nation want God. They desperately want God. They desperately want to know him. They desperately want to feel his forgiveness, but they refuse to do it God's way. Does it sound like anyone? Jonah. Jonah desperately wanted to hear from God. Jonah desperately wanted to serve God. Jonah desperately wanted to be a messenger of God but he just didn't want to do it God's way. He didn't want to go to the people who God wanted to go to. He didn't want to bring the message that God wanted him to bring. The good news is God gives him a second chance and the good news for us is God will continue to give us a second chance and a third chance to become obedient. Isn't that amazing? He won't give us a second or third chance to change direction or to manipulate him or to change his mind. No, no, no. He will give us a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a hundredth chance to become obedient to his sovereign will and plan. That's our God. God is relentless in his redemptive message to humanity. He will not change the terms of his offer of forgiveness, restoration, and union with God. His offer to the world is, Come listen. 
And his call to the Christian and to the church is go and tell. Later in Romans 10, Paul continues, but how will these people, these nations, how will they call on Jesus, on him to save them, unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have not heard about him? And then how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That's what God says to the Romans. That's what Paul, or what God says to Jonah. And that's what God says to you and to me. He said, how will your world, your Nineveh, how will your Rome, how will those people in your society, how will your neighbours, how will your children, how will your loved ones, how will they be saved unless they believe in Jesus? Because the Bible has already said, Jesus declares of himself, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. And no one before or after can come to the Father but by me. How can they be saved unless they believe in him? There isn't another way. But how can they believe in him if they don't hear about him? If they haven't heard the good news message? If they haven't heard about a God who is rich in mercy and love and forgiveness, a God who cares, a God who helps, a God who forgives, a God who restores. And I realise that this is somewhat of a repeated message over the last number of months for me, but I am consumed by the message that we're carrying. We've been given the great message of redemption, the great message of the gospel, the great message of a God who is all powerful and all loving. Yet I don't think we often, in our day-to-day -day walk and in our, our conversation, do we share that message? We're too busy talking about the weather or the price of fuel or COVID or our family or our loved ones are showing photographs of where we've been. Paul says, how can they believe if they've never heard? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? He's asking us the question. God is asking Jonah the question. Go and tell them. Otherwise, they can't hear. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? Let me tell you, God has sent you. When we look at the story of Jonah here, this recently repentant Jonah, who has survived death and been restored in his communion with God, he now has experienced a lot of life since he last heard God speak to him. Maybe he didn't realize that. God speaks in, in, uh, in the first chapter, the first verse of the book of Jonah and says to him, Jonah, go. The next time Jonah hears God, a lot of life has passed. He's been hiding and hiding. He's run away to a foreign land. He's got caught in a shipwreck. He's become vulnerable before sailors telling them, this is me. He's almost drowned. And then he's been eaten by a large fish. Then amazingly spat out a life and safe. A lot has happened between the first time God speaks to Jonah and the next time God speaks to Jonah. Chapter three is the next time Jonah hears from God. I don't have how long that took. Did it take a week? Did it take a month? Did it take a year? What was the time scale? But I know this, that the, between God speaking the first time and God speaking the second time, there was life and all, and all of its fullness with all of its problems and all of its challenges. And for you and for I, the same. Has God called you? Has did God, God burden on you? When you've been praying, has God laid on you someone in your family? Has God told you to help your neighbor? Has God told you to forgive that person who hurt you? And maybe a lot of life has happened between when he first told you to do that through his word and where you are today. And maybe you're hoping that there will be a softening of that message. Maybe you're hoping there will be a, a change of message. Maybe you're hoping God will say, no, okay, listen, he went through a whole lot, so I'll make this easy for you. Learn the lesson from Jonah. He goes through a whole lot and God doesn't change the message. He says, it's still perfect, go. So Jonah now hears a familiar voice, the voice 
of God. The voice of God. Jonah's restoration is complete. God is once again speaking to him, inviting Jonah to faithfully fulfill God's sovereign will. What is God's sovereign will? Go. Go proclaim the message I gave you. What's the difference? This time Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Obedience often follows the trauma and the trials of rebellion. For me, I don't think Jonah expected any different command from God the second time. I think he knew God. I think he experienced God. I think he knew the God, the great unchangeable. And he knew after going through all of these traumas and trials and challenges of life, that God wasn't going to go, well, I see you've been through a whole lot. You've maybe done enough. He was saying, go. My purpose is not yet fulfilled. The reason that I've made you, the reason I've called you has not yet been fulfilled. So go. Complete the work. And I love that phrase that he used. He, He invited Jonah once again to faithfully fulfill God's sovereign will. And today, maybe that's what God is doing with you. Maybe that's what God is doing with me. He's saying, I see where you are. I know all the difficulties, the sicknesses, the sadness, the frustration, the pain, the heartache, the heartbreak. I see it all. You have the story like Jonah, except you had no will in it. But you've had all of these challenges. And now you're here on the beach of life. Now you've just survived. You've just got through them. And you're thinking, time to retire or time to get up. And God's saying, no, I'm inviting you once more to faithfully fulfill God's sovereign will. He's inviting us again to be partake of that, to partake of his, his will. Well, what is his will? Go and proclaim the message I gave you. That's what it is. So what is, your consuming, what is consuming you in your prayer life? What's disturb, disturbing you in your sleep? What's robbing you of your joy and your peace? And what does God's word say about that thing which concerns you most? Let me give you one phrase, which I think sums up all that I want to say today. Just like Jonah, it's time to obey. His message hasn't changed. Maybe you've got a bit older. Maybe you've experienced a whole lot more things. Maybe you're a bit more grateful. But his message hasn't changed. If he called you to India, he's still calling you to India. If he called you to next door neighbour, he's still calling you to next door neighbour. If he called you to forgive, he's still calling you to forgive. If he called you to give and to help, he's still calling you to give and to help. He will not change. So the first thing that we're saying today is that there was a new conversation, but when it's with God, it's the same topic. God doesn't change the topic until it is fulfilled. The second thing is this, when I read about Jonah, um, God wasn't saying to him, you need to be creative. He was saying to him, you need to be courageous. And I'd say that to you today. God isn't saying, you come up with some great slick, online, reading in a book, some, some, some wonderful way to present me. In fact, Jonah didn't have to come up with a creative way to, pre- to present the message of God. It says he literally walked for a whole day telling people in 40 days, this city is going to be overturned. That was his message. There's a beautiful truth in the simplicity of the gospel message. It does not overpromise and underdeliver. It is the divine message of God's sovereign mercy to an undeserving world. It's revealing a benevolent God. I woke up this week with this thought of benevolence and I thought I knew what it meant and I wasn't sure so kind of checked it out a little bit it's because the thought was Jonah had an issue because God was a benevolent God. What is benevolent? Well-meaning, kindly. It comes from the Latin word ben and valent. And ben means well, well, and valent means to wish, well-wishing. 
desiring to do good. God towards Nineveh, Nineveh was benevolent. His desire was to do good. There are many qualities in God we will never fully understand. We can speak of God's self-existence, self-sufficiency, uh, eternity and trinity, yet we must always accept that we don't understand them completely. For we're not like God in any of these qualities. He is God and we are his creation. The infinite is beyond our understanding. This is true of most of God's attributes. The God of wisdom, the God of truthfulness, the God of mercy, the God of grace, the God of justice, the God of wrath, the God of goodness, the God of faithfulness, the God of love, and many others. We understand the words, we just don't fully understand how, why, and to what extent he will um, display those attributes. Many of the modern theologians when you, on this subject only want to emphasize the love of God. In fact, that gospel grace message talks about the love of God in the church, and I know I do it a lot. We talk about the God who loves, the God of love, the God of love, the God of love. Um, and sometimes that, that's at the expense of some of God's other attributes, some of the other qualities of God. So I'm not saying minimize the love of God, but we have to have a balanced view of God. And I thought about that. I thought, is love the first attribute that is revealed of God in the Bible? Well, it's not. The first attribute of God revealed in the Bible is God as the creator and the sustainer of the world. We read it in, in the beginning was the word. Um, and God in the beginning said, let there be light. And there was light. John tells us in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's in, in the New Testament. In Genesis, it says, uh, in the beginning, God's, God, God said, let there be light and there was light. He's a God of creation and a God of sustaining. Words that are used in theology are things like self-existence, self-sufficiency, eternity, sovereignty, holiness, and omniscience. He is a God that is divine beyond us. So the first attribute we read of God in the Bible is God the creator and the sustainer. And as we read through Genesis, the second attribute revealed in the Bible may really surprise us. Because considering how much we talk about the God of love, and God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. I said it every wedding, but it's true of life. God's second attribute revealed in the Bible comes after the fall. Before the fall, he is the God of creation. But after the fall and the rebellion of the human race, the next attribute of God that we see is the wrath of God as he deals with fallen man. He doesn't just say to Adam and Eve, it's okay, you made a mistake, I love you, so everything's okay, just leave it. He says to them, I still love you. But his wrath, the, the, that attribute of God, the wrath of God, desires to be fulfilled. And he said, therefore, there will be consequences for your sin. Because that's the justice of God. When we sin, he forgives. But there are consequences for that sin. There's a price for that forgiveness. And we know that for Adam and Eve, it's to do with re re reproducing and the pain of childbirth. It's to do with having to toil the land hard for a, for a meager return compared to the Garden of Eden, being put out of paradise. And ultimately, it is death. Where these bodies that were created in God to be sustained by him, will then decay and fail away, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, that they'll go back to the dust of the, of the land. So the first attribute revealed in the Bible of God is God the creator. The second one is the God of wrath. How can we talk so much about the God of love? Only after the God of wrath or the attribute of God's wrath has been revealed can we see adequately and talk about the love of God. Undoubtedly, God was loved before the fall of man. That's true. In eternity, he was love. But the full measure of that love is seen only when he offers his son, Christ Jesus, for our sins. Romans 5, 8. While we were sinners, Christ died for our sins. 
revealing not only the creator, not only the judge who judges justly, the God of wrath, but the God of love. So God is not only benevolent, wishing well towards us, but he is omni-benevolent, all-loving. God proved his all-loving nature by sacrificing his only son, providing an opportunity for humanity to reach heaven. I was thinking about these verses in the Bible that declare the benevolence of God, that God loves us, that God has always loved us, but that God is a God of justice and also a God of forgiveness and also a God of creation and also a God of recreation. Matthew 5, 45, for he gives the sunlight to both the evil and the good and he sends the rain on the just and the unjust alike. God gives nature to us that things may grow and sustain whether we're righteous or unrighteous why because he's benevolent he is well wishing his he is looking towards us he is for us romans 2 4 don't you see how wonderfully kind benevolence tolerant and patient god is with you does this mean nothing to you can you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin. His benevolence is there for a purpose, that we would understand how he loves us, he would understand how he, 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 he is kind towards us, but for this reason, that we would see Jesus and repent. James 1, 17, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all of the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Everything that we have, every perfect thing in our life, every gift that we possess comes from him, benevolent. He is a God who is for us. He is a God who loves us. He is a God who is kindly towards us. And then the most famous verse in the New Testament, John three sixteen. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his only son, his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The God who shows his benevolence ultimately through his son who sacrifices his life for our forgiveness. Do you know you're loved by God? Do you know all of those feelings you've had? Does God love me? Does he know me? Yes, he does. Romans 5, 6 and 9. You see at just the right time when we were still part as Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person some may possibly dare to die. But God, listen to this word, demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for our sins. He loves us. He is for us. He was for Jonah. He was for Nineveh. He's for humanity. That's why he doesn't wipe out Adam and Eve. He's for his creation. Ephesians 2 and 8, God saved you by grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. He's saying, not only have I created you, but I continue to sustain you and I provide for you in the natural and in the eternal. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. He wor his works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just is he. That's our God. That's the God who is calling you. That's the God who's inviting you. That's the God who's drawing you. Finally, Malachi 3 and 6. I am the Lord, I do not change. That is why your descendants, O Jacob, are not already destroyed. Benevolent. Epicurus, the philosopher, suggested that if God was benevolent, there should be no evil in the world. He said, therefore, he's not benevolent. He's malevolent. And malevolent, same um, roots, valent to mean to wish, but mal meaning ill or, or evil. He suggests that, that God is evil, he's against us, because if he wasn't, then there would be no problems in the world. Let me tell you, God is benevolent. It says this in verse 10, when God saw what they had done after they heard the message of Jonah, they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Why? Because he is not malevolent, he is benevolent. And that's why God, that's the message God has for you, for me and for our neighbours.